And greetings, welcome to the Evidence Reasons Academy. Um, back here, if you see the television set, that's uh, I finally got the American Heroes channel going on my cable. I had to just do some adjustments to the cabling of the house, and I'm able to get one of my favorite channels. Um, the other favorite channel is Fox News. So, greetings. This channel is a uh, companion channel to the Evidence Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel, which is really my main channel. But there's a lot of academic things that I like to explore that kind of supplement <clears throat> and also, you know, just kind of give kind of the. I wanted to have this channel where I could cover some prerequisites to understanding creation evolution. <clears throat> um, but it's really great to just be well-rounded in a variety of topics and, um, and I, it's giving me insight. It's a chance for me to learn uh, things I didn't know. And also this, some of the ideas I can develop more fully on the ac academic channel. And if they're, uh, you know, if they're highlights, I bring them to the, to the main channel. But for those who really want to nerd out, we, uh, I show stuff like that here. But then we'll just uh, just explore whatever topics, current events, history, economics. I just find it beneficial to just be knowledgeable of uh, these things. And sometimes we pick up something that will be of value or uh, something that gives us insight to uh, reality. I only, uh, I only found out recently and YouTube has a really good algorithm for figuring out what sort of things I'm interested in. It, it, it somehow knew that I would be interested in the account of uh, a certain individual, a Russian officer named Vasily Arkhipov. It turned out, just kind of the brief summary, in 1962 there's the infamous Cuban Missile Crisis. We were very close to nuclear war. The Russians were building a base on, in Cuba, which is just very good, almost swimming distance to uh, the United States. I mean, you'd have to be a pretty good swimmer. Some swimmers have managed that trip. And uh, they're putting uh, ballistic missiles there. They could have, uh, it, it was frightening. And President Kennedy of the United States uh, uh, did not like that, and we were on the brink of nuclear war because that was seen by the United States as extremely provocative. And so the United States blockaded Cuba. A Russian submarine tried to break the blockade, but that submarine was armed with nuclear torpedoes. If they had, if the Russians, uh, there's a lot of protocols you know, there was some a disturbing level of independence. They didn't have the level of communication capabilities we have today. Uh, so even with nuclear weapons, remember, they uh, this was still kind of in the vacuum tube era. I mean, there were probably transistors at this point, but this is the vacuum tube era, right? So there are a lot of things in terms of communication that weren't all that good. Anyone that watched the movie Crimson Tide, it's actually inspired slightly by the real world events in Russia with the Russian Navy, not the American Navy. The, uh, the Russian submarine commander, now it was a diesel electric submarine, not a nuclear submarine, but it had nuclear armed torpedoes. So a nuclear submarine is a submarine that has reactors to power the, uh, the propellers and to give it, um, to, to give it power to be able to, uh, to, to propel itself through the sea. But then there are also conventional submarines in the sense that it was diesel electric to propel it, but th it had nuclear tipped torpedoes. And this is, th this raised some interesting issues. The, uh, the submarine was not in contact. When it's submerged that deep, it has a hard time 
being able to make radio transmissions or receive them, and it was out of contact with Moscow, the, 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 the crew, the officers were instructed that in case they believed that Russia had been attacked and wiped out, they were to carry on the war. And in, in carrying on the war, they, had, they did not have to ask permission if they had uh, concluded that war had broken out and that communications were cut because the United States had already fired on Mother, Mother Soviet Union, Mother Russia. So, uh, yes, I made a slight mistake. I said he was a Russian naval officer. Technically, he is a Soviet, Soviet naval officer. So 75% of the Soviet Union at the time was uh, uh, Russia, but it included other states like uh, <laughs> Ukraine. Anyway, the uh, captain of the boat concluded that... Uh, a nuclear war had broken out. This belief was reinforced because he was his submarine was being depth charged, and uh, <laughs> he decided that he was gonna. He said, "Arm the nuclear weapons." He was gonna attack the. Uh, he was gonna head for a U.S. carrier, fire a nuclear-tipped torpedo. Uh, it was 10 kilotons. There's a good chance if that baby went off, it would probably kill the, sub, the, the people in the submarine too. Uh, um, we don't know. Now, if that, if that nuclear weapon had gone off and suddenly, uh, you know, the U.S. Navy reports to John F. Kennedy were under attack, the, the Soviets had detonated a nuclear weapon President Kennedy might have pressed the button and started an attack on the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union sees all these missiles coming in and blowing them up, they're like, okay, we're going to fire back. And they would have f fired on the U.S. And as, as far as the Soviet Union and the United States, this is the end of civilization as we know it. <clears throat> now, certainly there are parts of the world that weren't hit. They, they could have high probability of survival, but there are effects in nuclear wars, such as nuclear winter. Uh, we don't know the effect on the planet. It is worrisome that uh, the, the planet could possibly go extinct. If enough of these bombs are set off, it would put so much ash and... Uh, <clears throat> contaminants in the atmosphere, that it would cover the earth, the sunlight couldn't get through, the, the earth would turn into a, a permanent ice ball. Um, we'd rather not find out how that experiment would go. There was, you know, it's debatable, it's still debated whether nuclear winter could wipe out the earth. So let's hope we don't have to find out the hard way all this to say, uh, as I read this article, and as I hope you um, can read along with me as I reread some of this the, this material, we have reason to be very grateful, and I think this is provident, and it's a warning. My personal religious view: this is a warning from God, just how fragile life is. We're not promised tomorrow individually, and civilization's not promised tomorrow. We are, uh, the world is right now is embroiled in a, um, a war. It's not a world war yet, but we have Western allies backing Ukraine against Russia. So we do have superpowers that are doing proxy wars right now, and we could be on the brink of nuclear war. I'm just like, guys, you know, don't take this, you know, <clears throat> don't, you know, don't take this for granted. Don't take it lightly. The, there have been a lot of close calls 
I myself, when I was uh, an undergrad at George Mason University, a general, a, um, a NATO general who was in charge of the nuclear arsenal, got a false alarm. And he said, all these missiles are incoming from Russia. They're going to hit uh, NATO countries. He, had, he was authorized... He may have been authorized, I don't know, to launch launch a nuclear counterstrike. And he told his subordinate, he said, let's wait on it, we don't know for sure. He said, uh, you know, it'll be all over in, 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 in like 20 minutes or something. It wasn't an outrageously long amount of time. And, um, you know, I think the general probably had made up his mind that, you know, what would we do, what level of confirmation would we have to get before we fire a strike? And <clears throat> he, he decided not to shoot. And he, he was a Christian. He came to our campus and related the event. And nothing, thank God he didn't fire. It was a false alarm. There have been other false alarms in the United States that are very disturbing. One time a training tape was being played. It somehow got to the main communication systems and it said we're under huge attack from the Russians. Somehow cooler minds prevailed and said there's something wrong. Turned out it was a false alarm because someone loaded a training tape. This is really scary, guys. Um, one could see if there's an escalation, someone's trigger happy, as it was in the Cuban Missile Crisis, it could have gone berserk. So now, I'm gonna read how it was that uh, Vasily Arkhipov was able to prevent nuclear war. And thank you all for joining us, um, for joining this discussion. Uh, this is great reading for me, and I hope it'll be interesting for you all as well. Now let me just switch. Hopefully I won't kill my video. All right, I'm still here. <clears throat> and here we are, Vasily Arkhipov. This a little bit. Vasily, okay, this Vasily Arkhipov from Wikipedia. Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov, born 30 January 1926 to, 9, to August 1998. Uh, he's just a few, he was born just a few months before my mother was a Soviet naval officer credited with preventing a Soviet nuclear torpedo launch during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Such an attack likely would have caused the major global thermonuclear response. Yeah, that's an understatement. As flotilla commodore as well as executive officer of the diesel-powered submarine B-59, Arkhipov refused to authorize the captain and the political officer's use of nuclear torpedoes against the United States Navy, a decision which required the agreement of all three officers. After his death, Arkhipov, Arkhipov has been widely recognized as someone who would save the world with his actions on the B-59. By the way, they don't have a name for the submarine. They just call it B-59. They need to give it some poetic name. Anyway, Arkhipov was born into a peasant family in the town of Staraya, Staraya Kupavna, Staraya Kupavna near Moscow. He was educated in the Pacific Higher Naval School and participated in the Soviet-Japanese War in August 1945, serving aboard a minesweeper. He transferred to the Caspian Higher Naval School and graduated in 1947. After graduating, Arkhipov served in the submarine service aboard, aboard boats in the Black Sea 
northern and Baltic fleets. And there was the K-19 accident. In July 1961, Arkhipov was appointed deputy commander and therefore executive officer of the new hotel-class ballistic missile submarine K-19. After a few days of conducting exercises off the southeast coast of Greenland, the submarine developed an, an, an extreme leak in its reactor coolant system. This leak led to a failure of the cooling system. Radio communications were also affected and the crew was unable to make contact with Moscow. With no backup systems, Captain Nikolai Zateyev ordered the seven members of the engineer crew to come up with a solution to avoid nuclear meltdown. This required the men to work in high radiation levels for extended periods. They eventually came up with a secondary coolant system and were able to prevent a reactor meltdown. Although they were able to save themselves from nuclear meltdown, the entire crew, including Arkhipov, were irradiated. All members of the engineer crew and their divisional officer died within a month due to the high levels of radiation they were exposed to. Over the course of two years, 15 more sailors died from the after effects. Involvement in the Cuban Missile Crisis on October 7th, October on October 27th, 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, a group of 11 United States Navy destroyers and the aircraft carrier USS Randolph located the diesel-powered nuclear-armed Foxtrot-class submarine B-59 near Cuba. The B-59 was one of four Foxtrot submarines sent by the USSR to the area around Cuba. Despite being in international waters, the United States Navy started dropping signaling depth charges, which intended to force the submarine to, to come to the surface for identification. By then, there had been no contact from Moscow for a number of days. Although the B-59's crew had been picking up U.S. civilian radio broadcasts earlier on, the submarine was too deep to monitor any radio traffic, as it was busy trying to hide from its American pursuers. Those on board did not know whether war had broken out or not. The captain of the submarine, Valentin Grigoryevich Savitsky, decided that a war might already have started and wanted to launch a nuclear torpedo. Typically, Soviet submarines armed with the special weapon only required the captain and the political officer to, to authorize a nuclear launch. But unlike the other submarines in the flotilla, all three officers on board the B-59 had to agree in order to authorize the launch. This was due to Arkhipov's position as Commodore of the flotilla. Before launching the nuclear to torpedo, Captain Savitsky was also required to get Arch Arkhipov's approval. The officers who needed to agree to the nuclear launch were Captain Savitsky, political officer Ivan Semyonovich, Masalin, Masalinikov, Masalinikov, and executive officer Arkhipov. An argument broke out between the three of them with only Arkhipov against the launch. Let me look. So it says he's Commodore of the flotilla, which is interesting that the captain of the ship is not subordinate to Arkhipov because Commodore of the flotilla would probably be more senior. But anyway, com he was Commodore of the flotilla. Although Arkhipov was only second in command of the B-59, he was the commodore of the entire submarine flotilla, which included the B-4, the B-36, and the B-130. According to author Edward Wilson, the reputation of Arkhipov had gained from his courageous conduct in the previous year's K-19 incident played a large role in the debate to launch the torpedo. Arkhipov eventually uh, persuaded 
Savitsky to surface and await orders from Moscow. His persuasion effectively, effectively averted a nuclear war, which have like, would have likely, which would have likely ensued if the nuclear weapon had been fired. The B-59's batteries ran very low, and its air conditioning failed, which caused extreme heat and generated high levels of carbon dioxide inside the submarine. By the way, lots of carbon dioxide can really cloud your mental capacities. Just bear that in mind. It surfaced amid the U.S. warships pursuing it and made contact with a U.S. destroyer. <clears throat> After discussion with the ship, B-59 was then ordered by the Russian fleet to set course back to the Soviet Union. In 1997, Arkhipov himself wrote that after surfacing, his submarine was fired on by American aircraft, the plane flying over the conning tower. One to three seconds before the start of fire turned on powerful searchlights, and um, one to three seconds before the start of the fire uh, turned on powerful searchlights and blinded the people on the bridge. When the commander blinked and blinked his eyes and could see again, it became clear that the plane was firing past and along the boat in subsequent similar actions. There were 12 overflights altogether, uh, were not as worrisome any longer. Aftermath. Immediately upon return to Russia, many crew members were faced with disgrace from their superiors. One out admiral told them, it would have been better if you'd gone down with your ship. Olga Arkhipov's wife said that he didn't like talking about it. He felt that they hadn't appreciated what they had gone through. Each captain was required to present a report of events during the mission to Marshal Andrei Grechko, who, su who substituted for the ill Soviet defense minister. Grechko was infuriated with the crew's failure to follow strict orders of secrecy after finding out they had been discovered by the Americans. <clears throat> One officer even noted Gretschko's reaction, stating that he, upon learning that it was the diesel submarines that went to Cuba, removed his glasses and hit them against the table in fury, breaking them into small pieces and abruptly leaving the room after that. In 2002, retired commander Vadim Pavlovich Orlov, a participant in the events, held a press conference revealing the submarines were armed with nuclear torpedoes and that Arkhipov was the reason those weapons had not been fired. Orla presented the events less dramatically, saying that Captain Savitsky lost his temper but eventually calmed down. Robert McNamara, U.S. Secretary of Defense at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, stated in 2002 that we came very, very close to nuclear war, closer than we knew at the time. Arthur M. Schlesinger, an advisor for John F. Kennedy, for the John F. Kennedy administration and historian, continued this thought, thought by stating, this was not only the most dangerous moment of the Cold War, it was the most dangerous moment in human history. Um, this didn't make headlines at the time because it was decades before all of this finally came out public. This is how close we came. There were some things that were just, we didn't want, you know, Russia, the Soviet Union didn't want to talk about. And the United States that intercepted the submarine did not board the submarine. They didn't know what was going on. They just told the submarine, we'll escort you to the blockade line, Moscow, told the submarine to head back for home. I mean, we, praise God, I mean, civilization as we know it nearly bit the bullet. And Emery Moyna's here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for visiting. I'm just uh, rambling on on just interesting topics. I think I had to cover this because, you know, God's watching over us. And when these events happen, you know, I just hope people just maybe reflect a little bit. We're not promised tomorrow. Civilization's not promised tomorrow. I think 
you know, also in light of the fact we have evidence the Earth's magnetic field is dying, there's genetic decay in our genomes. I've been saying, guys, we need to be on our knees. We have to stop thinking we're going to be our own salvation and that we're going to build utopia. Maybe God will grant us grace like in the time of Josiah before the return of the Lord. And before the return of the Lord, the consensus view of biblical prophecy is that it's going to get real bad. And But the Lord commands us to pray for our leaders so that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all dignity, for this is pleasing to God our Savior. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2. So um, I'm just going to finish a little bit more about Arkhipov and then I'll read some other articles. There is a compelling video, uh, a cart uh, video that I left in the video description if you want to see an alternative presentation. For uh, copyright reasons, I as much as I wanted to play it along with my reading, uh, I wanted to respect the intellectual property of the authors. So I couldn't play it here. So let me just continue reading. Emery, it's great to see you. Praying for you, brother. And hopefully he'll join me in a discussion sometime coming up. And hopefully there'll also be some good news on his school. Anyway. Arkhipov continued in the Soviet Navy service, commanding submarines and later submarine squadrons. He was promoted to Rear Admiral in 1975 and became head of the Kirov Naval Academy. Arkhipov was promoted to Vice Admiral in 1981 and retired in the mid-1980s. He settled in Kupavna, which was incorporated into the Zel Zeleznardor, I can't pronounce it, Moscow Oblast in 2004, where he died on 19 August 1998. The radiation to which Arkhipov had been exposed in 1961 may have contributed to his kidney cancer, like many others who served with him in the K-19 accident. Nikolai Zateyev, the commander of the submarine K-19 at the time of its onboard nuclear accident, died 28th August 1998. Both Arkhipov and Zatayev were 72 at the time of their deaths. Ark Arkhipov was married to Olga Arkhipova until his death in 1998. They had a daughter named Yelena. Arkhipov was known to be a shy and humble man. In a 2012 PBS documentary, documentary titled The Man Who Saved the World, his wife described him as intelligent, polite, and very calm. I think I want to see that documentary. Much of what is known about his personality comes from her. According to her, he enjoyed searching for newspapers during their vacations and tried to stay up to date with the modern world as much as possible. In the same interview, Olga alluded to her husband's possible superstitious beliefs as well. She recalls walking in on Vasily burning a bundle of their love letters inside their house, claiming that keeping the letters would mean bad luck. In popular culture, the character of Captain Mikhail Polenin, portrayed by Liam Neeson in the 2002 film K-19, The Widowmaker, was closely based on Arkhipov's tenure on Soviet submarine K-19. Similarly, Denzel Washington's character in Crimson Tide, 1995, is an officer who refused to affirm the launch orders of a submarine captain. Leon Okendon portrayed Arkhipov in season 12, episode 1 of Secrets of the Dead, titled The Man Who Saved the World. It was aired 23 October 2012 on the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The 2021 novel Red Trader by Owen Matthews includes Arkhipov as the major viewpoint character and is dedicated to him. The musical group Converge dedicated a composition called Arkhipov Calm to Arkhipov in 2017. In recognition of his actions on board B-59, Arkhipov received the first Future of Life Award, which was presented posthumously to his family in 2017. Offered by the Future of Life Institute, 
This award recognizes exceptional measures often performed despite personal risk and without obvious reward to safeguard the collective future of humanity. In 2002, Thomas S. Blanton, the director of the U.S. National Security Archive, said that Arkhipov saved the world. Jesus is Savior of the world, and he used Arkhipov to save our lives. Um, it would be five, it would be four years later after this incident that my family immigrated to the United States. They were still in Indochina. But as I said early at the beginning of the show, if nuclear war had broken out, even if bombs didn't land in places like Australia, there could have been enough dust and smoke that the atmosphere would have been so opaque, sunlight couldn't get in, the earth would have turned to an ice ball. Once it turns to an ice ball and reflects sunlight back into space, it may remain a permanent ice ball. We don't know. It's hotly debated whether nuclear winter could be so severe it would end civilization. Um, Let's hope we don't have to find out experimentally if that's true. Um, experiment, I mean, that's a euphemism for having a real war. So, I mean, you know, life is very fragile. Uh, let us praise the Lord for every day that civilization is alive, and we, especially here in the United States where we have the comforts of, of uh, advanced civilization, it's really, uh, it's a glorious, for all the problems that we're undergoing relative to most of human history, it's a glorious time. So <clears throat> let me now just cover uh, some other articles because I was curious. Uh, so there is this article. It'll retell a lot of what was in the what was in the um, Wikipedia article, but let's see. Arkhipov. So the thumbnail I showed was of him and his wife. They were really a lovely couple. Um, this is a beautiful picture. The man who saved the world, and that's his wife, presumably his wife, Olga. Soviet submarine B-59 and the man who single-handedly prevented nuclear war. You probably don't recognize his, his face, but he's likely the only reason you're alive. Thank God for him. The story of his heroism was suppressed for over 40 years. 40 years. This is why we're only learning about it. And the announcement in this was, interestingly, a new opera is to tell the story of a Soviet naval officer who in 1962 narrowly prevented the world from entering a nuclear war. Vasily Arkhipov was born into a peasant family near Moscow in 1926. After serving as a minesweeper in World War II, he began working aboard Soviet submarines in 1947, rising through the ranks before helping to prevent mutiny on a nuclear submarine when there was a problem with its nuclear reactor. Due to the incident, eight crew members were killed and Arkhipov himself became sick with radiation poisoning, receiving a dose that would eventually lead to his death in 1998. To most people, that would be enough incident for one lifetime, but for Akhrapov, it was just a footnote in his life story, as he would go on to single-handedly prevent World War III. Arkhipov was serving as second-in-command of the Soviet B-59 nuclear submarine at the time of the missile crisis. After the U.S. ordered a naval blockade around Cuba, the Navy began to drop depth charges on Soviet submarines in order to force them to surface. The Soviets had been warned ahead of the non-lethal charges being dropped, but this hadn't been conveyed to the commanders of its submarines in the area. This lack of communication 
led to the captain of the B-59, upon seeing charges being dropped at his vessel, concluded that, concluding that World War III had broken out as they were clearly being attacked. Captain Vitaly Savitsky ordered that the submarine's 10 kiloton nuclear torpedo be prepared, ready to launch at a U.S. aircraft carrier sending fallout towards land. If the nuclear torpedo had been launched or any of the rest of the submarine's nuclear arsenal, it would have likely led to retaliation. And given the tension of that moment in history, nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, especially if the U.S. believed the command to fire had come from the Kremlin itself. <clears throat> in order to fire the missile, however, the process required the captain, the ship's political officer, and Arkhipov to agree to the launch. Arkhipov was the only one of the three men who argued against launching nuclear weapons. After a long argument, he was able to convince the others not to launch and instead surface the vessel and request orders from the Kremlin. The, or the opera named Arkhipov goes through the story of the incident from the initial excitement and camaraderie of the submarine submariners through their in increasing deprivation to a tortured state in which decision to destroy the world seems almost logical. And the opera is set to run October 21st and 22nd at the Kirk Douglas Theater in Los Angeles. And just for grins, there is the announcement. I almost wish I could see the video of this. Um, <clears throat> I like some opera. I like the Wagnerian opera, especially Tristan and Isolde and the Flying Dutchman. There's some arias I like. Um, even though I'm a lover of classical music, um, it's not really my cup of tea. Uh, I did see, what was it? Um, I wish I knew the name. Uh, I, s some girl uh, who was an opera singer just said, hey Sal, why don't we go watch the opera? I of course, I'd say yes. Um, I liked her. She liked me, and we, we hung out, and we had champagne after the opera. Um, and that's the only opera I've ever been to live, but I listened to it um, uh, via recording. And in fact, <clears throat> some of my shows, you'll hear, you know, I'll show that, that Valkyrie bomber and you'll hear Ride of the Valkyries. That's from the, the opera um, Di Valkyrie, Valkyrie, Di, Di Valkyrie. So anyway, so there's going to be an opera. There is something here. <clears throat> Again, if you want to get docu a slight documentary, a different take, in the video description is a documentary and for intellectual property out of respect for others intellectual property I'm not putting it here uh, as much as I wanted to um, yes now I remember what I, what I wanted to say in the Wikipedia article notice <clears throat> that in the case of that particular submarine it required three officers not the usual two. So God put someone there and it happened to be someone respected. Arkhipov, what if Arkhipov died in the incident the last year and wasn't there? Who knows who might have been there? Arkhipov obviously had a lot of character. He was willing to stand up to the captain and say, no, you don't have, you don't have my approval to fire that torpedo. He was very, very highly respected. And there was an argument and remember, this is a diesel electric submarine. They're running out of oxygen, a lot of CO2. You start to go a little crazy in those situations. The temperature is very high because the air conditioner had broken down. And so this is, this is a bad scene. Arkhipov, like God's grace, God's mercy extended through Arkhipov. So let's continue. And maybe the last article, let me see if I can, do I have, I had one more. Yeah, there it is. 
this, uh, uh, these articles are in the video description if you want to read, plus that video I suggested. Uh, so here it is. And this is Arkhipov, obviously much older, when he became admiral. The world only found out, hang on, this is more detailed. The world only found out about Arkhipov's heroics, Arkhipov's heroics 50 years later. And this is June 2019. Why is this man the only reason we are still alive today? Unknown to the world, Russian officer Vasily Arkhipov single-handedly averted nuclear war at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. On October 27, 1962, the world nearly erupted in a nuclear war which would have wiped out most of the planet's population. Okay, uh, alright, I'm sorry for the obnoxious ads here. <clears throat> And Armageddon didn't, hap didn't happen because of one man. And Armageddon didn't happen because of one man, a softly spoken, calm-headed Russian submarine officer called Vasily Arkhipov, to whom all of us today owe our lives. Only 50 years later did anyone else know about the incredible story and how the world was just, just seconds away from catastrophe. As Thomas Blanton, director of George Washington University's National Security Archive, said in 2002, a guy called Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. And in 2007, 19 years after his death, Arkhipov was honored for his heroic actions with a new Future of Life prize, which recognize, recognizes those who've taken, who take exceptional measures to safeguard uh, the future of humanity and that is the uh, that is Olga his wife and you can see the couple in their younger years and this is them I mean she still looks beautiful and young in that picture and there is Admiral now Admiral Ar Arkhipov Yes, he deserves those medals. <clears throat> the world was in the grip of the Cuban Missile Crisis when senior officer Arkhipov was on board a Soviet B-59 submarine in the Caribbean with instructions to head to Cuba. In recent days, tension had been ratcheted up to, the, to breaking point with an American spy plane having been shot down over Cuba while another U-2 U had got lost and strayed into Soviet airspace. On October 27th, the Soviet sub was spotted by U.S. forces, and an American destroyer, the USS Beale, began to drop non-lethal death charges on the B-59, intended as warning shots to force it to surface. The Beale was soon joined by other U.S. destroyers, which piled in, to pummel the submerged submarine with more explosives. I shouldn't laugh, but that's what was going on. What the Americans didn't know was that the B-59 had a tactical nuclear torpedo on board with the same power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, and the officers had permission to launch it without waiting for, appro for approval from Moscow. Okay, this is Arkhipov submarine had a nuclear torpedo on board. You can see, okay, why are they um, bare-chested? It's extremely hot inside a submarine. It can be extremely hot inside a submarine. Apologies again for all the ads. Deep down under the sea, the sub's captain, Valentin Savitsky, thought the Americans were firing bombs and that he and the crew were about to be blown to pieces. Believing that World War III had broken out, he ordered the B-59's 10 kiloton nuclear torpedo to be prepared for firing, aimed at the USS Randolph, the giant aircraft carrier uh, leading the task force. Vadim Ordolov, an intelligence officer who was there, later wrote, 
the Americans hit us with something stronger than the grenades. Uh, apparently with a practice death bomb, we thought that's it, the end. Oh, yes, why didn't I run ad block? Good, good advice. I do have one of those. Uh, un momento, please. I can do this. Hang on. One moment. I'm, 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 I'm briefly going to go uh, off channel here so I can start my ad blocking. One moment. See if I can block the overlay ads. Good idea, Emery. What would I do without you, bro? I hope we, we do a show sometime together. Hopefully we'll do a celebrations show. Okay, the, the ads are blocked, but we have lots of uh, blank spots. Okay. It's still better. All right. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, now let me get this bigger. And this. He said. The Soviet captain then shouted, Maybe the war has already started up there. We're going to blast them now. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not become the shame of the fleet. Okay, so when they fire off a nuclear torpedo, the, you know, the torpedo doesn't have a lot of range. So when this 10 kiloton thing goes off with half the power of a Hiroshima bomb, uh, most likely you're going you know it's going to be such a big explosion it's going to basically destroy the uh, the guys that fired it and again remember they're they're being subject to carbon dioxide poisoning they're not thinking their thinking can be affected plus their air conditioner was knocked out they're running out of oxygen they're they're getting lots of carbon dioxide and it's overheated inside the submarine if the B-59's torpedo had vaporized the Randolph, the nuclear clouds would have quickly, the nuclear clouds would quickly have spread from sea to land. Um, the, um, the Americans eventually forced the sub to, sur to the surface. That probably is the sub. The incident came amid the Cold War tensions of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So there were some people saying no war over Cuba. The U.S. would have certainly retaliated, sending their own nuclear warheads to strike Moscow and other enemy targets. In turn, Russians would have dropped nukes on London, the air bases of East Anglia and troop concentrations in Germany. The next wave of Russian bombs would have wiped out so-called economic tar targets, a euphemism for civilian populations, and more than half of the UK population would have died. Meanwhile, the Pentagon would have followed their own nuclear war plan and hurled 5,500 nuclear weapons against the 1,000 targets, including China. The, the fact that this terrifying doomsday scenario didn't happen, the fact that this terrifying doomsday scenario didn't happen is down to one man, Vasily Arkhipov, who was 34 at the time, Savitsky's equal and flotilla commander responsible for three Russian subs on the secret mission to Cuba. Um, yes, this is very interesting. Even in the U United States Navy, um, there can be conflicting command structures where an admiral um, at times is subordinate to the captain of the ship that the admiral's riding on. That, that, that can happen. And uh, in this case, the, the quote-unquote admiral, 
the flotilla commander, was second in command of the boat. So this is all very interesting, but um, that's just a side note. Needless to say, he was a very respected officer that he was made flotilla commander. Savitsky's equal and the flotilla commander responsible for three Russian subs on the secret mission to Cuba. And Ray Giordano, shalom, shalom. Maybe someday uh, you can join me, Ray, on, on this show. I'd be honored, sir. Each of the three Soviet submarine captains in the ocean around Cuba had the power to launch a nuclear torpedo, but only if they had consent of all three senior officers uh, on board. Uh, that's actually not true. It was only this on B-59 that was true. And here's a picture. It says U.S. forces had circled Cuba to not allow Russian ships in. After Savitsky's order to strike, one of his supporting officers agreed, but Arkhipov refused to sanction the launch of the weapon. Trying to calm the captain down, Arkhipov assured him that their ship was not in danger and that the explosions dropped I dropped either side of the sub, noisy but always off target, were just warning signals. As the drama unfolded, President Kennedy also worried that the Russians would mistake the depth charges for an attack. Holy smokes! His brother Robert Kennedy later said that hearing the U.S. W was dropping depth charges over the Russian sub was the time of greatest worry for the president. His hands went up to his face and he closed his fist. So he's getting a lot. Oh boy, this is a detail that's I just learned of. Is this is the first time I'm reading this particular part of this article? The president's listening, hearing all the actions. And the commander said, "Okay, we're dropping bomb. We're we're dropping depth charges on the submarine." And he knew the submarine could have nuclear weapons on it, and it did. Holy smokes! <laughs> Poor President Kennedy. <laughs> It is not known how long Arkhipov argued with Savitsky, but the nuclear warhead wasn't readied and the sub rose to the surface where it was met by a U.S. destroyer. And here's President Kennedy. He was reportedly worried when he heard about the submarine. The Americans didn't board the sub didn't, the Americans didn't board, and the sub was ordered to turn back and return to Russia. The American had no idea. The Americans had no idea that the sub was carrying a nuclear torpedo until around 50 years later. The Americans had no idea that the sub had been carrying a nuclear torpedo until around 50 years later, when the former enemies met at a 50th reunion and shared the story for the first. <laughs> okay, this is in the modern day. This is incredible. The the um, the combatants combatants in World War One, combatants in World War Two, after in time of peace, combatants after the Cold War will meet and reminisce. And this is coming out. It's like, hey, guy. Hey, I was dropping those depth charges on you, and he said, "Yeah, I was about ready to fire a nuclear tip torpedo." Yeah, this is this is how it you know this is interesting history. I love hearing it when you hear the combatants have a conference and they get to exchange war stories from their respective perspectives. Wow, that was also when the f world first learned about Arkhipov's heroism and just how close humankind got to catastrophe. <clears throat> Arkhipov, described by his wife <clears throat> Olga as modest, soft-spoken man, continued in the Soviet Navy and in 1975 was promoted to rear admiral and became head of the Kirov Naval Academy. Not a beautiful picture of the couple. It's beautiful. And I showed an earlier photo of that. It's a beautiful couple. <clears throat> Arkhipov, who was married to Olga, was later promoted. He was promoted to vice admiral in 1981 and retired in the mid-1980s. 
Ironically, though, Arkhipov himself fell victim to that which he saved us all from. He died on August 19, 1998 from kidney cancer, probably as a result of being exposed to radiation during an accident on board a nuclear submarine in 1961. And I read, I earlier read the account of his, uh, his heroism on K-19. He survived a nuclear uh, leak exposed to radiation in 1961. He recovered enough to be commander, to be an officer in 1962 on that fateful day, October 27th, 1962. This is remarkable. Maybe we should, maybe I, I'll try to make a mental note to celebrate a great victory for humanity, um, disaster averted. Uh, and, you know, let me just close in prayer. And Ray, Emery, if you're there, Paleologos or anyone else, um, I'm going to offer a prayer and then I'm going to just uh, close. Let me see if I have my my exit videos. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I prematurely fired off the end credits. L let me pray. And uh, I think I'm going to have more shows like this. This is a lot of fun just to, to review documents and just to share. Um, uh, it's kind of a break from my work day at the end of my work day and uh, it's very consoling to do stuff like this even if we only have a few people joining us uh, it means a lot so to me yes Emery knows that knows that theme song um, <clears throat> Ray Giordano says I kind of missed the Cold War yeah the, I, I, you know, that was, for the United States, this was a glorious era, you know, uh, the world today is in a variety of ways far more dangerous, but anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I lift up Ray Giordano, and I thank you for his friendship and comfort uh, to me, same for Emery and all those in the side chat. We just lift up the world situation to you, you've commanded us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to uh, offer prayers of thanksgiving for all our leaders as bad as they are um, to offer thanks and supplications for all men so that we may be able to live peaceful and quiet lives in all dignity and in service to you which is pleasing to God our Savior and so I offer that prayer because you've commanded it yet we know one day that prayer request will be denied because uh, there'll be an end of the world and some bad things will come down before the glorious return of our Lord and Savior at the battle of Arm the real battle of Armageddon and uh, until that day Lord we commit our souls and our lives to you help us to love you with all our heart mind soul and strength help us to bear our crosses each day in service of you let this day, let this night uh, be about you and please guide our steps. Uh, thank you for your love. Please bless this tiny channel and the other channels that I've, um, I've had the privilege of running. And uh, thank you for my dear friends on the internet who are, who are like a second family to me. Thank you for um, my dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ that I've met online. And now, Lord, uh, we close this stream. Uh, let it, uh, let those who view it by recording be blessed. We ask these things in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, with that, Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini. Take care, and God richly bless all of you.